lecture 20 of ECE 5312, and we're just going to pick up where we dropped off from lecture 19, which is that closed form solution I was talking to you about regarding probability of error performance, especially when you more than two signals and you're trying to get the exact representation. And the way to do what we're going to do here is that we chose a very specific waveform, or m-dimensional waveform. We chose one that is orthogonal in all m-dimensions to each other. So that way we can have a mathematically tractable solution. Otherwise, this thing gets really messy very quickly. So what we saw in the last class, and I made an error. So luckily, this lecture slide corrects Nespa, right? Correct? What happens is, because the ZIs are Gaussian and they're based off of an AWGN channel, it turns out when you do the math that the ZIs are in fact uncorrelated and therefore independent with each other because they're Gaussian. And so because of that, this sort of intersection of all these pairwise comparisons, Z1, sorry, Z2 less than Z1. Z3 less than Z1, Z4 less than Z1, and so on and so forth. This is sort of the probability of correct reception, which means under no uncertain terms, Z1 always has to be top dog. Z1 always has to be bigger than all the other Zs. Has to be. So it's either all or nothing, and that's why we have the intersection. It turns out because the ZIs are independent of each other, we can break up this sucker and essentially becomes the product of the individual probabilities here. What is the probability that zi will be less than z1? And, and it becomes multiplied across all i's, all those pairwise probabilities, right? And we saw that this expression here, assuming z, let's hold z1 constant just for now, okay? z1, what we get essentially um, is it turns out it's kind of it's kind of funny because remember that the AWGN noise channel we make an assumption is IID right identically and independently distributed right so what is this expression here so let's go over to the screen what what I mean by this because because I think in the last lecture in lecture 19 it was kind of confusing I really feel bad I have I had something a little bit messed up. So let's do this. What do I mean by this? Is the following. So, so what happens is we have the probability that Z I ah uh, no, I don't want that. Z I is what? Is less than Z one. Is that right? Is that right? So, so what happens is, let me just double check. Yes. Okay. So we know that I will be equal to 1 minus the probability that z i, oh, I don't know why I'm doing that, folks. Sorry about that. Is greater than or equal to z1. We know that this guy here is a Q function, right? So we know that that guy, if we have a Gaussian, and that's your Z1 marker, what this tells me is this, we want basically the integral from Z1 to plus infinity of the Gaussian, okay? Uh, squared divided by 2 sigma squared to z, right? So what happens is this guy is like the q function. This guy is actually assuming when we calculate it, it turns out this is a zero mean. What it turns out is that if we do that integral, this integral is equal to q function. And the only thing that we have to worry about is this pesky guy here, right? This sigma, which 
regular Q function doesn't have a sigma in it, right? And there's also, ah, wow, okay, I, that is really neat. How did I do that? Okay, this guy here, that's sigma. So if you do a change of variables, what do you end up getting? So let's say that the variable is z. z is there, z is there, right? So suppose what we want to do is we want to get rid of that guy. So the, and we know that that guy here is also sigma squared. So what we want to do is suppose we do a change of variable. Let's say y is equal to z divided by sigma. So if you do the change of variables throughout all of this, what do you end up getting? Well, if you, if you go through this, what you're going to find is in the end, you're going to get, before I even go to the q function, what you're going to get is essentially the integral. It's going to be z1 divided by sigma to infinity, right? And this guy is going to be 1 over 2 pi. And that's going to be e to the minus y squared divided by 2 dy. And that, folks, is equal to the q function of z1, because remember that guy, divided by sigma. Okay? So as a result, this expression is going to be equal to this. Now notice, like, you know, just intuitively, if you do the calculation for every one of those these cases, these pair, these these er, these zi's, right? They're all going to have the same. They're all going to have the same statistic, right? They're all based off the same noise, different waveform, correct? Different waveform, deterministic waveform, but the statistics are the same. It's going to be zero mean all of them. They're not going to be correlated with each other, and they're going to have the same variance at the end of the day. And what turns out is that. When we have this formulation, if you notice, it's totally devoid of what si i not equal to 1 is equal to. So this is beautiful. So I think the expression that I had in the last slide in, uh, in lecture 19 was kind of too many steps ahead. Because now with that, what's no, my, what is my new probability? Remember that the probability of s2 less than ah, not equal. S2 less than, S, uh, sorry, Z2 less than Z1 intersect Z3 less than Z1, d -d 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 -d, all that, is equal to the product of, let's say, J or I, whatever, 2 to M, right? The probability of ZJ less than z1, right? And then we know that this guy here is actually, this guy here is actually this guy here, and this guy is totally independent of j. So it's actually multiplied by m minus 1 times. What we get at the end of the day is it's going to be this, m minus 1. Let me erase the top part. So. What we get at the end of the day is that the probability of i2 to m of zi less than z1, which is equal to the product, that almost looks like the entrance to a Shinto shrine. It really does. <laughs> um, z i, okay? And then that in turn, because this guy is literally equal to this is going to be equal to 1 minus q function, right? And that's a beautiful result. And if any of you have ever been to Japan, it's really cool. Check out Google Maps, and it will point out every Buddhist temple and Shinto shrine. 
And I think it's usually signified by this, like a Shinto shrine is usually has this big arch and I'm not sure for uh, students from China, uh, it's like, do you have similar, similar structures like this, like a, to a temple or a shrine, like it's a arch with, yeah, like entrances to Chinatown, right? So I think so, so yeah, yeah. Anyways, I digress. It's just really cool when going to places like that. So, so we have this formulation. Now, remember what I said. Z1 is actually random. We're, we're saying to ourselves, yeah, 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 this is deterministic. It's not. So just like what I said before, what we need to do, so this, this expression here, th like what we have really, assuming we talk z1 is equal to. But the answer is we don't. What we need to do is we know statistically what z1 is equal to. So what we do is now, in order to find out what the probability of correct reception is, we need to average across all z1s, okay? So in order to do that, we take the expectation of the probability of correct reception given z1, and we average it across all z1s, which is equal to this expression here. So that's the Gaussian PDF, and we're integrating from minus infinity to infinity across all z1s. So that is held by the dummy variable here, x, so already you get to see that very messy calculation because what we essentially have is we have one Q function which contains an integral. Oh, and look at that. We have another expression here, this Gaussian. Can we find closed form in terms, can we solve that integral? Probably not, right? So we have this Gaussian. We also have a Q function. So we have a Q function multiplied by Gaussian and we're integrating all of that, right? It's going to get messy. So, what do we do? Well, let's first, let's first of all find out what the mean and variance of Z1 is. Because we look at what Zi's are, right? And that's the easy case. It turns out, remember Z1? So what is Z1? So Z1 is the energy plus Ni, right? And so what ends up happening is, what's the average? Well, Ni we know, N1 is going to be equal to zero. But the energy, what's the expected value of a deterministic number? The deterministic number. So that's equal to E. So we have a non-zero mean, and it's equal to the energy of the signal. How about the variance? Again, if we do the calculations for the variance, we get this beautiful answer here. Now, integrate and average across all these Q functions. And that, folks, will give you probability of error. So, so that's why when I was talking about, you know, the projects that all of you are doing, and trying to find, you know, closed form expressions, this is what I'm, like, you know, this is where things get ugly really fast. And this is just one case. And then you have like Rayleigh and stuff, and that also is not too pretty. So. So, given that, what we can do is the following. We know, okay, so there's a few tricks we can, can pull. So we know that this guy is a Gaussian PDF, right? And we know that if we integrate the PDF by itself from minus infinity to infinity, this gives us unity. So this is trick one. And so what we want to do is the probability of symbol error, okay? Because bit error, now what we need to do is how many bits are represented by that symbol, right? And so then we normalize according to that. So what we do is the probability of error is that messy expression. What you do is a change of variables. Oh, yes, you do the change of variables. So we let y equal to x divided by sigma z1. And we let e divided by sigma equal to 2 square root of a uh, square root of two gamma. And the thing is, this is not me. This is actually, this is a, a trick. If you do this, if you pull this change of variables, what you actually turn out getting, what you end up getting is this actually, this lovely expression here. And you might say, okay, what is that thing? Well, what happens is, um, this is probably the closest that we can get to a closed form, right? So we have that nasty Q function. That's an integral in itself. 
And then we have that e to the whatever squared. That also doesn't have a very nice closed form in that form format. But this here is as close as we can get. So let's say if you do numerical integration using Maple or Symbolic Toolbox in MATLAB or whatever, and you plug in values, you can actually solve for the probability of error. Or if you have a few Russian friends that are really good in math, because one of the all-time favorite books of mine that I always wanted to buy, but I always take out a library, uh, there are a couple of Rus Russians, uh, uh, Gratstein and Rizik, and they have this like these these horrible integrals, and they take a lot of time to drive what the closed form solutions are. That's like that, and also Abramowitz and Stegen, which is like numerical tables. I know I have a very messed up like library. Like you know, my wife's library is all these like you know, books about marketing and about vegan and da 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 and mine is like numerical tables and stuff. Or the most recent book I bought was How to Build Your Own Stone Wall Without Any Mortar. That actually is serious stuff. It turns out that if you make your own stone wall and it's about 10 feet long, it's equivalent to in weight. If it's like two feet tall, it's about five tons or something like that. That's a lot of rock, you know. I have tons of stone walls all over my property, but it was not me, it was the previous owner like from 1890 or something. Anyways, cool stuff, huh? So that's why we like bounds. That's why we make the shortcuts that we make. Because otherwise, imagine, like, you know, if I give this as a quiz question for you guys next week, OK, figure it out yourselves. Oh, you would hate me. I better bring, I better bring my wife's car instead of the new car I bought. So yeah, otherwise the tires, right? So OK. So. Any questions? So I think I'm putting everyone to sleep. I'm sorry. So what we're going to do is we're going to move on to, again, our friend, the random face channel. Remember we talked about this before a little bit, where we're trying to do, we're trying to deal with, let's say, a detector, and we have a random event, either random amplitude, which could be from fading, or a random phase, which could cause a phase rotation if you have a phase modulation. So suppose we take the latter. We take the phase rotation route. And this, I'm always looking at you and saying, OK, go back to the, um, suppose, <laughs> suppose that we have this signaling waveform. It's modulated by some sort of cosine. Oh, and lo and behold, we have a theta here that's actually random. So what we want is essentially, we want some way of dealing with this random phase channel, right? So, so what we do is we, 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 we approach the following. Okay, so this, what we're trying to do here is essentially, suppose you guys transmit some signal, and then it's totally, its phase is totally messed up. We don't know what the phase is and such. What this technique I'm about to show you, in fact, this is actually one of the problems I think I assigned accidentally in the problem set last week, where I talk about non-coherent detection. So non-coherent means t I, my timing information, my phase, I'm not in phase. I basically, my receiver is going to have to operate based on, let's say, the energy of the signal alone. Forget the phase, right? No timing information. We could be out of phase. It doesn't matter. So what we want to do is, the first thing is, we, we saw what the model is for the signal, right? It's S I of T times cosine. Uh, 2 pi f, which one is it? f naught, that's a carrier frequency, t, plus theta, and noise. So what we need to do is, this is interesting. What happens when we take a baseband signal, like si of t, and we multiply by a cosine with an f naught? We're modulating it. We're, doing, we're going from baseband, from dc, and we're modulating to f naught and minus f naught. Right? Now, what's the model for the noise? It would be whatever noise is present at minus f naught and f naught. So what this guy is here, this n of t, we have an n c of t and we have an n s of t. What we're doing essentially is we have baseband in phase and quadrature noise, and we're modulating those two guys out to n f naught and minus f naught. So what I'm looking at, going to my favorite toy. Oh, this is so wonderful. <laughs> I want one for Christmas. So what happens is 
we take my, the, you know, the signal. Okay? And so that would be SI of F plus F naught. This would be SI F minus F naught. And that's DC. That's zero frequency. That's minus F naught. That's plus F naught. And then there's a noise contribution there, and there's a noise contribution there. And why is that? Because at the receiver, there are several ways I can do it. I can either filter here and filter here, in which case the noise and the signal are inseparable. Or I can bring it all, everything down the baseband, noise and all, to DC and do the filtering there. But either way, there will be noise present in my signal. So that N of T, so you have the R of T equals the SI of T cosine 2 pi F naught of T plus theta, which is the phase, which I don't know, plus N of T. N of T is going to consist of an in phase and quadrature component that's modulated at F naught and minus F naught. And so if I have that, what ends up happening is the following. Remember, we talked about this before with power spectral densities. What happens is if we want the, the baseband, the low pass power spectral density, essentially is when we modulate those upper and lower signals back down to DC, right? So, so we have this representation here. So the in phase and quadrature components of the noise, essentially is you take the noise at the upper and lower bands and you modulate them back down to DC, correct? Now, how do we, how do we operation? It's very easy. The way we do this operation is we use, essentially we take, like how do we, how do we, how do we represent this? So what you do is you take your receive signal, you modulate down to baseband, both if you have cosine and you have sine, right? Because you might have in phase and quadrature signaling, and then you low pass filter. Why do you low pass filter? Because we already have a band pass signal, and we're, we're basically modulating it down to DC, but we're also modulating it to 2F0 and minus 2F0. So we have to cut those guys out. That's what the pass filter does. OK, so how does that look like? Don't say anything. OK. So what do I mean? So let's say this is my signal. Yay. Minus F0, F0. So that's R. And what I do is I mod modulate it by cosine. And there might be a two term. So let's bring the two term here. 2 pi F naught of T. Same thing. We take this guy and we do it with sine. So what do we get? We should have 2 times at 0, and then at 2 F0 and minus 2 F0, we get these guys. And then the low pass filter truncates. So at the end of the day, what we get is RC of T, this guy here. That's our in phase contribution for our signal, right? Now, the bottom guy, same thing, right? So we're doing sine modulation. Sine modulation is different because you've got this, right? But it doesn't really matter. So when we do that, you do the exact same thing, and then you low pass filter, you keep whatever is in the middle. And you get R S of T, much the same way. But let's, let's take this one step further. So what happens is we have this model. We get low pass equivalents of the received signal, which contains the noise and contains the signal in there, right? The SI, like essentially this guy here, SI cosine theta. Where did we get this from? 
think about it. When we did the cosine modulation, we also ha what happens is when we modulate it with r of t, r of t contains si of t. And what is it? Cosine 2 pi fc naught, no, sorry, f naught t plus theta. So that's cos a. Multiply by cos b. So it's, what happens is you get a double frequency term, disappears, you get a DC term with a cosine phase term. So what I mean. So remember, what ends up happening is, remember we have R of t cos 2 pi f naught of t. That's going to be equal to Si of t cos 2 pi f naught of t plus theta cos 2 pi f naught of t. And then noise, n of t, cos 2 pi f naught of t. Now this guy here, that's cos a. That's cos b, right? So we use trig identities, and what we're going to get is a double frequency term. And, and that's why we have the, ha the 2 here. It's going to be half, right? So we're going to get a, we're going to get a half cos a plus b plus cos a minus b, right? And if we do it that way, this is your double frequency term we don't care about, and this is only going to leave us with cos theta, right? So that's why at the end of the day, if we do this modulation, this entire thing basically now becomes Si of t. Oh, now we have this stupid cosine phase term. Oh, okay. So now, how do we fix that? I know, I'm much calmer in this lecture than lecture 19. Because what happens is, this is what we do. Let's set up our situation as follows. So first of all, let's vectorize the whole shebang. So we choose an orthonormal basis set. So now what we have is RC and RS are these vectors, right? And as well as NC and NS. And what we're trying to do is, just like before, we do the optimal receiver, right? But now what we're doing is we're averaging across all tetas, right? We can get any theta that we want, right? So it's random. So let's average. So we have a conditional probability. What is the probability that we see, okay, like we get this row given that I transmitted SI and have this phase, and then I average across all phases, right? Because it could be random. What's a, what's a great random variable for phase? Uniform. Right? Great. So what happens is we go through this process, but remember that R is not by itself. R has an in phase, that cosine term, and a quadrature, a sine term. So in fact, we actually have a joint probability between RC and RS, the vectors, right, these guys, Given si and given theta, we have this representation. And so what ends up happening is it turns out that these two guys are, in fact, independent of each other. So as a result, we can split up that joint PDF into the product of the two individual PDFs. And we know what the Gaussian is of a sort of n-dimensional vector, right? It's going to be the norm of the variable minus the mean. And in this case, it's kind of interesting. Just like before, remember when we did um, a, you know, sort of the joint PDF of, let's say, a receiver, right? And what happens is we had the noise vector, and we saw what the joint distribution is. And we know that the noise vector is equal to the received vector minus the, si the actual transmitted signal vector. This is almost the same deal. So now. And we do the math, what do we get? So let's expand this out. Let's expand out the exponent 
in each one of those PDFs, and we get rc.rc minus 2 si.rc cosine theta plus the energy of signal i times cosine theta squared, and we do the same thing for the other guy as well, and then if you expand this out, what you end up getting is this beautiful thing here too, right? So what happens is, what do we do now? This is almost exactly what we did before with our decision-making process, right? We choose one guy over another guy. So what do we, what do we have here? Remember when we did that, um, you know, we, we tried to do the correlator implementation, the optimal detector. Remember we had the noise. We were represented by the observed signal and what the transmitted signal could be equal to. Well, we do the exact same thing here. And then what are we trying to do? What we're going to look here is, okay, we got this thing. What are we going to try and do? We're going to try and maximize the probability, right? What we're going to do is we're going to try and find, like, you know, we're going to try and make some sort of decision rule out of this. So I'm several steps ahead. But what happens is I want to come up with fi finding which SI gives me the maximum probability here, right? That's ultimately where I'm heading. And remember, what does max depend on the exponent? No. So I can take the natural log and I can say, by to a bunch of stuff. If you notice, I just put C there because I'm totally lazy. Because I know that that's not going to affect the decision statistics whatsoever. If I work this through, let's use some shorthand. This guy here, rc.si, I call him lci, rs.si, lsi. And so what ends up happening is this guy here, I can re-express as the square root of the square of LCI plus the square of LSI, all that times cosine theta minus um, alpha. And alpha is equal to the inverse tan of LSI divided by LCI. So it's just another way of expressing going from Cartesian to spherical coordinates, right? So that, that first term, the square root of LCI squared plus LSI squared, that's like the radius, right? And the second guy, well, all he is is essentially the phase to this representation. So the first guy is, like, what we have on the left-hand side is the Cartesian representation, and here's the spherical representation, okay? Now, let's take this one step further. We want to average across all theta. We average across all theta. What's theta? It's uniform. So if we do the average. It turns out, oh, this is the thing I dreaded when I was an undergrad. My freshman year, I never understood it. Modified Bessel function of zero order. Really intimidating. Like, you know, this Friday when you guys are relaxing after a very, very difficult, uh, you know, first half of the semester, and you go with friends and hang out, bring this thing up. Say, hey, have you seen this? And you this and say, just intimidate all your arts friends. Right? I'm going to try this tonight, but I think my wife will say, I'm not impressed. Take out the dog. <laughs> yeah, that's what really matters. Cap when Captain comes up and he's wagging his tail, he would not be impressed by mod modified Bessel function. He would be impressed when you say, let's go for a walk, and he goes crazy. <sighs> the thing is, for, for a dog with three legs, he jumps pretty high. modified Bessel function. And so when we do that, that average across all theta, uh, all those thetas gives us this guy. What's actually pretty cool about this modified Bessel function? Monotonic. Monotonically increasing. So if I try and maximize, maximize that probability, right? Maximize the probability of R given SI for any SI, right? Because I want to find out which SI gives me the best, because that probability, like the probability that, 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 we, that you know, we receive that R given that SI, to make that probability the largest, we need to choose the right SI. And what it turns out, because it's monotonically increasing, this would have made me so happy in my freshman year. I don't need the Bessel function. I just need its argument because it's a one-to-one -one mapping, right? 
if the argument into the modified vessel function is increasing, so is the modified vessel function. What does the maximum care about? It doesn't care about the absolute value. It cares about the relative value between two points. So I can actually get rid of the I naught. Phew. Better yet, square root, positive square root. Monotonic, right? Say goodbye to that. And the N naught, that's a constant for all SI. So what I'm left with is this max SI LCI squared plus LSI squared, which is equal to all that stuff I was telling you about the dot product. This, folks, gives us the following. It gives us, essentially, if you calculate this, what you're going to get is essentially, remember we had that correlator realization for the optimal detector, right? Every branch. So here's S1, S2, S3, S4, S5. It, now this is much worse. Now it's S1, oh yeah, in phase quadrature. S2, in phase quadrature. Phase, uh, uh, S3, in phase quadrature. I'm basically branch and then branch again. So this is the first branch, right? This guy here just gives me LCI. Then I put the square law device. Do I care about phase? Absolutely not. Say bye-bye to phase. Bye-bye. Same thing here. OK? So uh, first of all, so we have this integrator. We have this cool stuff. Let's cut and paste, because oh, I love cutting and pasting. And what we get is energy detector 1. Energy detector 2, energy detector M. And the energy detector, we're like encapsulating now, is we take R of T. We do all that processing to give me the LCK and LSK. Squares. Add them together. Then, the output of that, we sample every T seconds. Dump, dump, dump. And then choose the max. Oh, yes. And what's so special about this? Do we care about the phase? No, not whatsoever. So the exercise for the student, ha, 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 there always has to be an EFTS, is now let's assume that we have no noise in this, right? Show that, that in fact, the LCK squared plus LSK squared is equal to E squared over 4. All right? Just for fun. If you're bored this coming midterm break and you're like, I really miss 5312. I want to do something really cool. Now you have something fun to do. Oh, I doubt anybody's going to say that. Yeah. So with that, that concludes um, lecture 20. OK. OK. So this is actually, you know, so I think, unfortunately,